Hey guys, this is Sumner from LandInvestor.co and I'm so excited to bring to you guys this two-part series breaking down our entire market selection, market research process. So the way we've broken this down is for this first section, we're gonna hop onto my computer. I'm gonna go through the two frameworks that we're using to source winning markets. What you need to know if you're just getting involved in land investing to actually say, hey, this is a good market, this is a bad market, how to compare and contrast. What we're gonna do after that in the second part of this video is you're gonna go over my shoulder and I'm gonna go through and actually select markets and you'll see exactly how myself and our Leah students in our program go and select the best markets to buy land. All right, guys, I'm so excited to bring this to you. This is our two part series on how to select winning markets. And truth be told, this is the area where we get the most questions. This is the area where there's the most confusion for newer land investors or even novice land investors who are six months in, a year in, two years in. I think there's just a lot of misinformation out there when it comes to selecting markets. And it's my goal, it's my responsibility to dispel the myths and bring you guys valuable, actionable content that you guys can actually utilize. So let's talk about the painful truth. Most land investors do not know how to pick winning markets. This leads them down the path of copying other investors' markets with none of their own research. You'll never build a successful land business if you play the game of copying other original ideas. Think about it like this. Like, how can you build an original business off of unoriginal ideas, right? You've got to originate your market selection and you've got to go out there and find the best markets, right? Because everything else in our business is going to cascade down from those decisions that we make on market selection. Where we decide to spend our marketing dollars, where we decide to pull data, all of those costs are going to remain content constant. The only thing that's going to range is our results. And those results are gonna be dictated by what markets we decide to play in. And so obviously this is a skill worth honing in on, right? Because our, our results are gonna kind of just slip down and cascade down from our market selection. Let's dispel the two main myths I see gurus, quote unquote, preaching in the land space. Um, first off, it's just like these over complex technical indicators, which are more noise than signal. And truth be told, I think they're so complex or so confusing that most newer land investors, they just sidestep them. They don't even use them, right? The thing with a framework or a model or a process is it's gotta be easy enough to implement. If you're giving me some over complex jargon, which maybe is really practical and successful and works, but if it's not easy to implement, newer folks aren't gonna actually implement it. That's a problem. The second, and this is my, my absolute favorite, is just work in the same markets as other land investors, essentially encouraging stealing other investors' ideas. Now, I'm not gonna point any fingers, but I think we all know who's predicated this idea of just, just go where the other investors are. I've tried this all, it's all honestly all BS. I'll watch my language here, but it is all BS. The first thing that we need to do is we need to develop a hypothesis. We must treat our land business like scientists. In my case, maybe I'm a mad scientist, I don't know. But you've gotta create a hypothesis. For example, I wanna acquire five to 40 acre rural recreational properties between 25,000 and 150,000, right? Every single business that gets started starts with a hypothesis. It says, I want to go service this market and solve this problem. That's quite literally what we're doing in the land business. And so we're gonna reverse engineer. Hey, I wanna go acquire infill lots and second tier metropolitan markets with a list price between 75,000 and 250,000. We've gotta get clear on what we're actually doing here, right? Just saying that you flip land is not enough. That's not a business. You've gotta get more tactical. You've gotta zoom in a little bit and create a hypothesis. And this is gonna inform us on where we need to start looking for markets. This is gonna inform us of saying, hey, we say yes to these opportunities, we say no to these opportunities. If you don't have a thesis, there's no way for you to clarify what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing as it relates to selecting markets. The only metric that matters in selecting markets is demand. Is there demand in the market, right? This is the stuff that no one is talking about. There's no other quote unquote guru talking about the only metric that matters are people buying land in those markets, right? There's over 3000 counties here in the US. There's so many markets to choose from. There's so many places that you could go waste your marketing dollars or waste the data that you're pulling and go buy land in markets that no one wants, right? Will you sell those properties even if the market's not in demand? Yes. But what's gonna happen when you buy a property that has a big spread that sells in you know 30 days, what does that have as to, in terms of downstream effects in your business? They're huge. The velocity of your capital, being able to turn that money over and over and over by working in markets where there's real demand is gonna make everything in your business flow much more seamlessly, right? So we need to figure out, is there demand here? Well, how do we sort, suss out if there's demand? There's four main tools we're gonna use. 
First is data tree, okay? Data tree is where we're gonna pull our data. We'll also do a little bit of due diligence on data tree. The second is land watch. The third is Redfin. And the last is Google Sheets. The only one out of this that costs money is data tree. If you guys want to get some discounted pricing, you can click down below. We've got discounted pricing with data tree, um, as well as a handful of other tools. So how do we actually know if a market is in demand? Well, we follow two simple frameworks. The first framework is using a relative comparison on Landwatch. This allows us to compare markets based on total number of sales and under contract listings. What I mean by relative is we can say, hey, let's go look at all the counties in Texas, and then you'll glaringly see, oh, this county is selling more land. There's more demand in this county. There's more demand in this market, and that's gonna inform us to start actually moving to step two, the second part of the framework, which is using Redfin to figure out all of the ratio of active inventory versus sold inventory. And we use a one month, three month, and six month window on that. Um, and I'll show you guys how we actually do this. But like I mentioned, the first framework informs us as what markets we should be investigating using our second frameworks. Think about this like a market research funnel. So top of the funnel is framework one, and then down below we have framework two, and this is gonna push us lower and lower in the funnel until at the very end of that funnel pops out an ingenious idea, an idea that says, holy crap, this is a great market to go work in. It takes more work than you realize, okay? To find great markets, you're going to need to look at a lot of markets, like finding a needle in a haystack, truly. The area most land investors get wrong is in regard to keeping detailed logs of all of their market research findings, right? If we're gonna be investing a boatload of our time, ideally on a weekly basis, to go look at all these markets to find a diamond in the rough, and we're not logging our findings, we're missing out on a huge opportunity. I'm gonna show you guys exactly what that opportunity looks like. This is imperative to your success. You must be tracking your findings. In our business and in our students' businesses, we use two different methods to track. The first is it's very simple. So our Market Mondays Google Doc. If you guys have been around in this channel for a while, you've heard me talk about this. Every Monday we add a little blurb about which markets we are reviewing. Quite literally think about this like a market research diary. Today, dear diary, I'm looking at Costilla County, Colorado. This is what I found there. Blah, 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 blah. The second method that we use is much more detailed. And this is a master spreadsheet tracking all of our findings. I'm gonna show you guys exactly what that looks like. I've quite literally never shown anyone this before. Not even the folks in our program have fully seen all the ins and outs of this. This is something that I've been working on for about six months now, and it's a masterpiece, right? What we see here is we're looking at the state of Oregon. We've got uh, are five different counties that we've identified from that first framework that tells us these are the counties we should be focusing on, right? This is where the demand is. And then using our second framework, we go and track all that information that we're finding on Redfin for the sell-through rate, right? The sell-through rate is just saying, okay, last month, 10 properties sold, and there's 100 active listings, so there's a 10% sell-through rate. And now we can start comparing and pitting these markets up against each other. The beautiful thing is we can get even more granular and break it down on an acreage range. And that's gonna tell us, hey, you know, in Clackamas County, Oregon, you should be buying two to five acre lots. That's where the highest sell-through rate is. That's where the most interest is. And this brings our process down from guesswork to hard quantitative facts. You should be buying this acreage range in these markets, enough said. Now, when you're first building this out, you're probably gonna have to track this yourself. That's okay, get used to doing some hard work, right? This business does require elbow grease. I don't care what anyone else tells you, it requires work. You're gonna to need to create this Google Sheet and start logging the findings that you're getting from your second framework using Redfin. This data set, I recommend updating it every month as those numbers turn over. Again, we're just tracking month one, month three, and the six month window, okay? Eventually, the list becomes so comprehensive that you can just use this to literally identify trends and to source marketing ideas, right? Every single month, I go in there and I say, oh man, this is where all the action is. Let me go spend my marketing dollars there. It takes all the guesswork out of the process. And the beautiful thing is that this is actually very easy to delegate. Eventually, you should have someone on your team tracking this and updating it monthly. We have someone on our team that spends about 10 to 15 hours a month updating us every month. Let's talk about how to structure your market research. So market research should be conducted weekly, in my opinion. Again, this is a skill, right? Let's pretend you're taking golfing lessons. You shouldn't go and golf once a quarter. If you're trying to get better at golf, take golf lessons every single week. It's the same story here. If you're trying to get better, conduct your market research weekly. I like to block recurring time on your calendar just for this activity. Uh, I recommend doing your market researching and pricing on different days. 
different skill sets using different sides of your brain. Um, let's just kind of segment them and have a day related to market research and a day related to pricing our mailers. Let's talk about building your moat. So the better you can become at market research, the greater the moat around your business will be. Look at the game of land investing. is a, It's a very uh, kind of commodity-based business, right? So the better we can get at doing the nitty gritty work, the market research, the more defensible our business is, the harder it is to compete with us. If you're going out there and ripping off Joe Schmo's ideas that you saw on land.com, you have no moat, you have no edge, you have no skill, right? So you should be leading the trends, not following the trends. All right, guys, we're going to move over to part two, where I'm going to show you over my shoulder exactly how we do this market selection process in real time. You can watch me quite literally do this. This is going to be super informative. If you guys like this content, give it a thumbs up. If you guys want to see more of our, our material, you want to get in the nitty gritty, you want to work with me, you want to work with people in our uh, group, you can join our free Leah Discord group. And if you think that this value is good, if you think our Leah Discord group is good, just imagine what's inside the Leah program. Just a shameless plug. I'll see you guys in part two.